All right, thanks so much for inviting me here. It's really a pleasure and uh, this is a new community for me. Uh, so as, uh, well, as you now know, I'm a financial engineer and I've been studying the stability of financial systems for the last maybe 10 years. Um, so now I'm looking at these new systems um, and I'm going to be looking at uh, basically stable coins which, uh, as I'm going to argue, are very similar to some of the financial derivatives that I've been studying. And uh, I want to look at some risks that, are, um, that pertain to these uh, uh, systems. And some of these risks are new and some of the, this, uh, some of the risks uh, are quite old and we have seen them uh, materialize in the financial crisis. So I'm a network scientist somewhere and I see networks uh, kind of everywhere and uh, as you expect uh, you're going to see networks as well uh, in, in the decentralized uh, finance uh, ecosystem. Um, so decentralized finance, obviously you know very well, this is a system that is growing and ha it has been exploding over the last uh, two years. So it, it basically went from zero to uh, maybe uh, half a billion uh, right now and it's fluctuating um, around, uh, around this um, this level. What is more interesting is this uh, is this picture that you have there, and what you see there is uh, what we call um, a core periphery network. So that is the, um, the, the you you see there um, users. Oh, it's much better with the with the doors closed. Uh, you see there the users of uh, several of this um, uh, f basically new financial services that are offered on the blockchain. So you have uh, somewhere there you have Compound, which is uh, a platform for, 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 for lending, collateralized lending, where the collateral is, uh, is crypto. Um, and, and what is interesting is you see that you have uh, some of this, um, some of the users are specific to each of these platforms, but many of the users are common to the, to the, to the different platforms uh, that you have over there. And that is what we call core periphery. So the core are the ones that are common, uh, that have a common um, that are common to, to, to these setups. Um, so we've seen this kind of core periphery networks uh, in the financial system and basically all types of uh, financial systems uh, look a little bit similar to this. So you have a bunch of uh, uh, central nodes and th those are very critical to the, to the system and it's very important to, uh, to, understand, uh, to understand them. Um, what is important from in the decentralized finance uh, setup is that uh, w when you see this picture you realize that you need um, you need a viable form of transporting value from one part of the ecosystem to the other and that would be a stable coin and uh, I, 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 I I like and I don't like the name stable coin. Uh, the stable, uh, it, it, it implies that you need a low volatility instrument that is able to, to transport value, but uh, stable also implies that you need it to be stable forever. And what I'm going to be arguing is that, in fact, you need, um, you need an instrument that has low volatility in a guaranteed regime. So uh, it doesn't need to be stable for a long time, but it, need to, it needs to be stable for the kind of uh, time uh, timelines that are um, that are usual for the for the for the for the ecosystem that we are looking at. So as I said, um, it's, it, it bears some similarities to the traditional financial systems. And in particular, we have seen uh, that complex systems uh, like the financial system, which was increasingly complex before the 2008 crisis, uh, we have seen uh, crashes. And here you have, uh, I have chosen in particular the example of AIG because uh, this points out uh, one of the most important risks in such system, which is the risk of network effects, of knock-on effects. So what happened in this particular case, uh, it was that we had um, uh, well, exponential growth in a class, in an asset class, uh, credit derivatives. Um, 
And even with that exponential growth, um, that asset class uh, was, uh, it was valued at hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and it was mainly uh, sold by financial institutions. Well, it turns out that AIG had a subsidiary which is called AIG Financial Products. And AIG Financial Products was one of the main uh, sellers of protection on credit default swaps. So it took uh, very large positions uh, indirectly in this, in this large market. Now, when the market crashed, this translated into huge losses for AIG financial products, which basically uh, almost led uh, the, the giant AIG to its knees. So, and it needed a huge bailout, um, and, and uh, eventually this also went to the overall uh, market. So you had this, uh, this big crash. Another important point and another important lesson that we have seen in the financial crisis is that a market which could be uh, initially quite small, could try, so it was, well, relatively small, right, because we're, we're talking here about hundreds of billions of dollars, well, it translated into losses that uh, eventually ended up in the orders of trillions of US dollars. So we ask ourselves, is it, uh, is it something that could happen again in this, uh, in this new uh, and decentralized uh, finance uh, setup? And we hope that it's different this time. So the problem that we are trying to solve in our work is, to, uh, is the fact that we have little uh, formal understanding of these systems. And there are complex uh, feedback effects, and as I said, some of these feedback effects are new, and some of them are, bear some resemblance with what we have seen in the traditional markets. And what is new, however, to these markets is that we do not have a truly stable asset that is readily available for, transport, for, for transactions and essentially transport transports of value from one part of the ecosystem to the other part of the ecosystem. And what we hope is that stable coins will come and fill in uh, this gap. Um, now, this is, of course, uh, contingent on understanding and having a complex inter this complex interaction of agent that does not go into the um, that does not go into the direction of creating and materializing large risks. So. Um, what we do is we develop a model. Uh, we're going to be looking at non-custodial stable coins, and that's actually very interesting because, um, well, in the traditional markets, the way um, we responded to the crisis was to create um, clearing houses. And the risk management for, for, for very large um, uh, volume uh, of, of financial derivatives was, uh, is now... Uh, is now transferred to this new, uh, to this huge and actually systemic, uh, systemically important institutions, which are the, the clearing houses. And now what we are looking into is decentralized finance, where we are hoping that uh, a system uh, is able to fulfill in a decentralized way a basic function. And the basic fun function is risk management, understanding and managing the risks uh, which, which, which affect uh, that system. So it is not clear uh, out of the many designs that we see out there which one is able to fulfill this, uh, this very important uh, role. Um, and very, very basic function, if you think about it, it's uh, risk management is, is really what underlines the stability of any financial system. Um, so, as I, as I hinted, um, we need a form of money that has low volatility and that is adapted to, to, to the blockchain. And um, I, I do think uh, that a stable coin remains... Um, a stable coin in the sense that forever low volatility, that remains a holy grail. So what our work shows is that uh, instead of that, what we have is um, we have regimes. So we have uh, a financial instrument uh, that, 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 that fulfills this, this role only uh, under a certain regime which we call stable. And under another regime which is unstable, well, it could be that the volatility of this instrument 
increases, right? But if you do understand the, those regimes and if you, if you find theoretical guarantees of being in one, one, on, on, on one, one side of stability or the other, then uh, this, uh, this, this instrument uh, can fulfill its function of, uh, of a currency and of transmitting value from one part of the ecosystem uh, to the other. And again, what you're looking at, uh, well, you're looking at maintaining low stability, uh, low, low volatility for the duration, the typical duration of the of the financial products that you see in the ecosystem, and that could be uh, months, years. It is never uh, a product that 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 lasts forever. Um, so our work uh, explains actual stablecoin movements, and um, what is also very interesting in this uh, in this new setup is that uh, the layer, uh, the economic structure, the financial structure, and the underlying blockchain uh, structures they could lead to different types of um, of, uh, of incentives, and they could uh, th there could be different types of attacks that are novel and we have not seen in traditional uh, markets. So uh, with cryptocurrencies, we, and of course we had blockchain, we had the first form of money that is truly adapted to internet. And now with Ethereum and with the, the generalized scripting functionality, uh, I think that the promise is um, to have financial contracts that are adapted to the internet, and we also have the promise of having risk that is managed in the decentralized way, as opposed to the, to the traditional finance where you need this, uh, this uh, where you need the clearing houses. But just like a clearing house, it wasn't entirely obvious how to, how to design one. It wasn't at all obvious how much capital there should be locked in a clearing house. I, I think that there is a challenge into making this happen for the decentralized finance. Um, so, so, so this is what uh, work, academic work, and uh, everybody um, who works in this area, um, academic or not, uh, it, I think should be looking into how how to transfer this, uh, this, this how, how to how to perform this function of mitigating risk in a decentralized way. So, um, so. What is the aim of a stable coin? It's, you, you need to have a protocol that stabilizes uh, the market price and the purchasing power. You need to have low volatility maintained as much as possible uh, so that it is usable and adoptable in a decentralized finance ecosystem. Um, there's two types of, as you know, of stable coins. There's the custodial ones uh, where the reserve assets are held off chain. Um, now, um, these are essentially funds, right? But um, what I would like to point out is that uh, when the size is so large, the fact that it's fully collateralized, um, it may not be true uh, in the case of large-scale liquidations. Because what matters is not the value of the fund in good times. What matters is the value of the fund when you do have, uh, when, when, when large risk materialize. So, so, so transparency, I would argue, is key. On the other hand, you have non-custodial um, situation where the, the most important thing and why I think that this is going to, um, that is going uh, one step further in the direction of decentralized risk management, you have this important quality which is transparency. People can come and see how the, how the reserve is managed. How you, you can see what is going on uh, in, in, in that particular system. So they are, and, and moreover, you have this, uh, um, you have the, uh, the lack of counterparty risk because the assets that are collateralizing that, uh, the, the, the non-custodial stable coin, uh, they are held on chain. So basically you have access to the collateral and agents in the system are all responsible to, uh, to manage, the, the, to manage to, for the risk management. But importantly, all agents in the system, they have transparency about what is going on in the system. And so this is, uh, this is a huge distinction between these new systems and the old ones. So um, I have here um, kind of a slide which, which uh, summarizes the different risks that are involved in the different types of stablecoin. So you have on one side, you have the custodial 
stable coins, which, as I said, they are very much like a fund where, uh, well, many of them, they, are 100, they have 100% reserve. Um, but the, the risk that comes with huge size is, of course, the market impact risk. What happens under a potential liquidation? What happens if we, if we, if we need to sell uh, a, large, um, a large part of the, of, the, of the reserve on the market? And we have seen, well, and it really depends what assets, what real assets are composing this fund. So you could have that you, you, the, the, the impact is very low because the, uh, the market depth of those instruments is very large and they can absorb a shock. But in most cases, I believe that the market depth cannot be infinite. So, 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 it, really depends, um, so it really depends on what, what assets are actually held. And uh, moreover, um, who is going to step in when, when, when such large art, uh, uh, large amount of assets could potentially be, um, be, be, be disposed on the system. So if they are not fully collateralized, we have also counterparty risk. But what is also very interesting, and I think this, uh, this would lead to novel academic research, is a new type of bank run risks. So bank runs, they are something that have been also cited as, um, as a cause of the financial crisis. So um, in a traditional bank run, and um, by the way, these large uh, custodial stable coins structures, uh, you can also think about them as a narrow bank. And what is a narrow bank? Well, the basic function of a narrow bank is to take money from depositors and invest it in assets. And it could be that those assets are very highly liquid assets and high quality assets. Um, nonetheless, uh, if, um, if the, one of the important risks for, for a narrow bank and for a bank in general is, um, is what is called the bank run. What if the depositors they go into an equilibrium and they all decide they want to withdraw their funds. Well, then the asset side is going to be liquidated. So the parallel to that is what if all the stablecoin uh, holders will want to have a global settlement? Well, then you're going to need to liquidate all the collateral, and, and, and this is a problem. Now, the way the bank runs have been solved in traditional um, financial uh, systems is, is by deposit insurance. So we all have our deposits, and they are insured by the government up to a certain level. Well, this wouldn't happen in such a, in, in, in a, in a custodial um, stablecoin setup. And as I said, the danger would be when, when one of these would be extremely large. Um, so you ask yourself, well, what would happen in the case of a bank run? And what is more interesting is that, uh, well, as I told you, I see networks everywhere. Um, so what is interesting is that the depositors here, they're not like randomly chosen, right? So they're not gonna be, um, they're not gonna be like samples from, uh, from, 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 from some populations. They're gonna be friends of friends and they're gonna have uh, links and they're gonna be themselves networks. So this leads to a new type of risk, which is the risk of a network-driven bank run. And, and there isn't so much work on that and we do not understand these risks uh, properly, I would say. So on the non-custodial side, there are other types of risks. There's the blockchain consensus risk, there's oracle manipulation, and what we are gonna be looking into are deleveraging spirals. So we are, so if we have on the custodial side, we have the bank run risk, we could, we could also have currency attacks. Uh, well, on the non-custodial ones, you have uh, risks in layer one, so that would be risks to the blockchain consensus, and then uh, you, uh, and then the layer two, those would be uh, risk to, risks uh, that would go for the, for, for the, um, for the top um, financial structure that is, uh, that is built on the, on the blockchain. Um, and one of the, these main risks is the uh, market deleveraging risk, because many of the projects that, as we currently see them, are leveraged, and I'll go into that in a second. Um, and so when you have large deleveraging, uh, then this could spiral into, um, into e even more liquidations, and this could get uh, quickly out of hand. So our, we are here, we're looking at layer two, and they are crypto collateralized, and we are going to be looking at stable coins, which are um, stable coins uh, designs, which involve leverage. Um, 
Now, that said, there is another important point, is that if we understand uh, the risks in the layer two, well, those risks and the probability of this uh, risk materializes, materializing, well, understanding that, that would give also uh, more information about the incentive structure in the first layer. So, so it's, they are not completely separated. All right. So um, now, as I said, uh, we have a setup uh, that is leveraged. So how does it work? Uh, in fact, a basic, uh, a basic financial contract that is very similar to a stable coin is this non-custodial uh, contract for difference. And the way it works is that you have two parties, A and B. They enter an over-collateralized contract in which the seller... You can call it equity holder or you can call it a speculator. So it's going to be an initiator of this contract. Pays the buyer a, a difference between the current value of a risky asset and its value at contract termination. And if the contract becomes under collateralized, so, so, so in this example, the collateral is ether. So that is going to be the risky asset. Um, so if the ether price goes down, then the buyer can trigger the settlement of the contract or the speculator can add more uh, collateral. All right, so the way it works is like this. So you have at time zero, you have a contract, everybody puts on the table 100, well, it's not the real prices nowadays, but it's for simplicity. Um, so you have one ETH is equal to $100 and one is e equal to $100. And the, you, there you have the stable coin and then you have the speculator. Well, for those of us who are used to balance sheets and thinking in these terms, uh, you can think about the speculator as an equity holder. The equity holder gets the up Side and downside depends on uh, well what happens to the risky asset, whereas the stable coin holder is like a bond holder. So, so unless all the equity is exhausted, they will not be affected. They will still hold $100 uh, worth of their uh, ETH at contract termination. So initially you have two ETH that's equal to $200, and then let's see what happens at time one where the price drops from $100 to $80. Okay, so you have, um, so now your two is, is are equal to $160. But remember, your stablecoin holder is like a debt, it's like a bond holder. They would still hold what is worth $100. Therefore, out of the two ETH that are worth $160, well, they hold $100 of that, and that's that's equal to 1.25. So they hold essentially the 1.25 of the ETH goes to the stablecoin holder, and then the rest goes to the speculator. In this case, the speculator, like the equity holder, has had its equity um, eaten up. So initially it had an equity of 100, and now its equity is equal to 60. So 40 has been eaten up. Um, so, so, so those are very simple contracts in financial engineering. Um, they are similar to a forward contract, uh, except that they, the, the, the price of that, we, we do not have f uh, fiat currency circulating in the system, right? Because there's huge, huge frictions to doing that. Um, so the price is only fixed in fiat terms, but the price is is paid, um, it, the payout is in units of the risky, uh, risky asset, okay? So now what are stable coins? Stable coins are variants of this, so they're variations of this. Um, and the, well, remember when I said that uh, we, in the, prior to the 2008, we had this, uh, this exponential increase in, in credit derivatives. One of those uh, important credit derivatives uh, are collateralized debt obligations. And those are, in fact, they set up a tranche structure. And in some way, um, the stable coins are very similar to this tranche structure. Um, there is a risk transfer that sets up by, by setting such a tranche structure. And uh, you have the equity tranche, and you, you could have intermediary tranches, and then you have a senior tranche, which is like senior debt. And the, the speculators are the ones that are holding the equity, and then the, 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 um, the, the, the stablecoin holders are akin to uh, holders of the, of, the, um, of the senior debt. And um, there is, however, a very, very important difference to the so-called uh, collateralized default obligations. The collateralized default obligations were in some sense static. 
So there was no dynamic deleveraging or leveraging uh, involved. Uh, they, they were set up at a time and then they, the contract was held up to maturity. Well, what you're having now is a situation where um, where um, you, you, you could potentially deleverage the, uh, the structure in a way to ensure its stability. And that is a very, very important distinction. So the, 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 the difference I emphasize, the contracts are now multi-period and agents can change their positions over time. The positions can be dynamically deleveraged uh, in a way to ensure their stability. Um, and the settlement times, they are random and they depend on the protocol. And a well-designed protocol will make sure that under settlement, the impact is very uh, small. And that is another important point. Um, so the, the way it works, so the mechanics of these contracts is as follows. You have speculators who are the, these equity holders. They are locking crypto assets in a smart contract after which they can, are able to create new stable coins and those are sold on the market and they are sold for additional uh, for additional crypto assets and therefore you have a leveraging in the position of the um, of the of the speculator um, now, if at any time you have that the collateralization threshold, or in some sense the leverage of the speculator becomes too large, the system will dynamically reduce leverage. And there's a variety of ways, and every um, project of stablecoin has a way to do it. And some are good and some are bad. Um, and uh, the, the, my, the point that I want to make is that the success of such system really depends on the way this, this management of leverage is done and the impact on the underlying um, assets. So uh, how is this, why would anybody become a, a speculator in a stable coin? Well, it is based on some idea of arbitrage and actually it's not true arbitrage because a true arbitrage means that you make money at zero risk. Okay, but uh, so assume away, uh, why is it called arbitrage? It says, well, if price is above target, so if the stable coin, well, let's say stable coin is above $1, well, the, the speculators will create new coins, and then if the system works properly, at some point it will go to target and they will pocket the difference. And the other way around, if the price is below target, then the speculators can repurchase uh, coins and then decrease leverage at a, at a discount. So, so you kind of make the pocket the difference between uh, well, when, when, the, when the price is above one and in, when it hits one. Now, why I say it is not true arbitrage? Because it is not true arbitrage because for, for, for it to be arbitrage, you need to have zero risk. Well, there, are, there is a risk of a deleveraging spiral. So, uh, and, and, then you, and then essentially, if you, if you, if you enter this, this kind of setup, you take on this risk of a deleveraging spiral, which means that the price, could, could, um, the price of your underlying asset could, uh, could decrease or otherwise uh, put the, um, your, you, you could be forced as a speculator, like in a, like 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 uh, short sellers, right? Like the, the 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 drama for a short seller is when the asset that you need to repurchase increases rapidly in price. Well, the same could happen here if the stablecoin price uh, has 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 a sharp increase, and then uh, if they are unable to repurchase it, then it could be even um, happen. It, it could happen that the market uh, breaks. So let me show you how it works. So you have this collateral uh, contract. You have speculators. Again, it's, uh, it's the, the example where one is, is equal to $100. So they lock this. Uh, uh, so, so this collateral, one, this one is, is now pledged in the collateral contract. And now what the collateral, uh, so now the collateral um, contract will allow the speculator to create 50 stable coins. Now, essentially, of course, there are fees because this is a lending mechanism, what is going on here. So you're, 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 you're kind of landed, the, the, the speculators is being land, uh, lent uh, 50 stable coins in this example. Uh, so normally there are fees, but in what we have here, uh, we've abstracted away from those. Um, so we create uh, 50 stable coins and you see that the collateral is still, uh, the ratio of collateral to, number, to stable coins created is two to one. So you see that it is, uh, it is uh, obviously an over-collateralized setup. 
Um, and at this point, the balance sheet looks like this. You have ETH that is, um, that is a pledge, it's $100, and then uh, you have um, uh, assets, uh, $50 worth of this stable coin, and then you have the equity, and uh, the speculator owes uh, 50 to the smart contract. And now what will happen is that they will sell these 50 stable coins on the market, and let's say that, of course, they will get another, f uh, so they will get for this, um, half an ETH at the price. Uh, so then, the, then you see here the leverage. So it has equity, it is the initial $100 that it pledged. It has debt, this 50 that is owed to the smart contract. And then the assets that are, um, that are essentially collateralizing this entire structure, they are 1.5 ETH. So basically for the, for, the, for the stable coin holders to be affected, then you would need to, all this collateral uh, of ETH to be, to be, to be, to be affected. So uh, in order to deleverage, what, could ha what, what one would need to do is repurchase the 50 stable coins to unlock their initially pledged collateral. Well, as I said, and one of the biggest risks is what happens if the price of the this stable coin increases in, in a market similar to um, what happens uh, to short sellers. All right, so... Um, now, there is also the protocol. So the protocol, uh, if the collateral will, um, will decrease below a certain threshold, then the, then the, the system starts to liquidate. So, so, it, so it has um, an inbuilt mechanism of deleveraging. Okay, and it can also be um, globally, set, uh, globally settled, this entire system, and then the, the stable coin, um, then um, the stable coin, uh, reserve um, being bought back by using the collateral. Um, so the model that we're looking into is a model with two types of agents, the, the stablecoin holders and the speculators, and they have different risk profiles, right? So the speculators, they want to make this uh, so-called arbitrage, and they are interested in, um, in, in um, um, uh, maximizing their profit over time. Um, and whereas the other ones, the, those are the stablecoin holders, well, those are agents who are motivated by holding an asset that they deem as stable, and stable for as long as possible. Um, so we uh, emulated this stablecoin protocol, which has global settlement, but we can have different design choices. So you have, as I said, the agents, the stablecoin holder, they choose portfolio weights in order to seek stability, um, and the speculator chooses leverage in a speculative position. Um, the assets are uh, Ether and this stable coin. The price that we get in our model is the price of the destable coin. Because remember, what we want to look is do we have, um, do we have spirals in which we leak, we, the, the, the destable coin price increases, then you have to liquidate more, then the destable coin increases even more, and you have to liquidate again. And, and the way we find the stablecoin price is by clearing, by setting, uh, clearing the market, basically equating the, the demand and the supply. So we, it, uh, the model works like this. You have that in each period, so it's a dynamic model. Uh, the new Ether price is revealed. We update Ether expectations. Uh, the stablecoin holder decides on the portfolio weight, so the, the stablecoin holder can keep part of its wealth in, in, in ETH and parts of its wealth in, in stablecoin. And now the speculator uh, who sees the demand can decide on leverage. And then you clear the market. Okay, um, so, so the stablecoin's motivation is to maximize the next period's return, um, and, the, and it's subject to several constraints. So there's the liquidation constraints that comes from the, from the protocol. So basically, if you reach the threshold beta, you, you need to deleverage. Uh, but then it could be that the, sta the, the, the speculator, this market maker, is going to deleverage by themselves, uh, depending on the kind of uh, risk um, profile that, that they have. And typically, what they are looking is value at risk. So they're looking at the probability. They want to, they, they want to set bounds on the probability to be liquidated in the next uh, period. So we have several results. And our first result is that there is a bound on 
the ability of a speculator to maintain the market. And we can find this with, with, with formulas that depend on the volatility of the underlying assets, on the beliefs of the speculators on, on the underlying asset. The bottom line is that you need to have a cushion. You need to have sufficient spread between the total ETH capital that agents are willing to put in the destable coin market. And what I'm talking about is the, is the, is the capital of both speculators, but also the, the, the stable coin holders, the other agents who have also the possibility to keep ETH as it is and not transfer it to the, to the, to the, to the destable coin market. So if you look at total capital that could enter into the market, the, the difference between the total collateral that is required to maintain the current market so that is the, taking into account the over collateralization. You need to have at least beta times what you currently have in stable coins. Well, that must be sufficiently high. So there's a lower bound on that. And if that bound is broken, then the market cannot be maintained. It cannot be, it cannot be cleared. And the other analytical result that we have, it's also that the speculators, they have limits on how quickly they can reduce leverage. And then you have these deleveraging spirals, which, ha which happen because the speculators, they need to repurchase stable coins at increasing prices. And when you have this kind of increasing prices, we have seen all this in financial engineering because those are convexity effects. It basically depends on the order in which transactions occur, and if you have uh, if you have several liquidations in a row, well, this could add up much more than uh, you know the individual um, effect of each liquidation. So they they, they could uh, spiral out of control. Basically, if you if you took each individual liquidation and it would have let's say an impact, well, if you look at the impact of all of them together, it's going to be much much larger because of the convexity effects in the price. And this brings me to to the point that you need financial engineering to decide on what those prices are because you need to see how uh, well how this um, you, you need to understand these convexity effects so the way it looks is like this you have first let's say demand is equal to supply and then there you have the collateral and then you have the price nicely at one for the for the for the um, stable coin and now you say that you try to reduce the you, there is a liquidation you reduce the supply then you eat the collateral then uh, because so we make an assumption in the model that the that the demand the that the weight um, of that the stable coin holders are placing in the in, in this market um, they they are um, they have a fixed weight, and so if the, um, what happens is that when the price of the stable coin increases, well, then they will decrease the demand because they keep a constant weight on the, uh, on the stable coin, so then this will decrease, and then you will have further liquidations, and again, because of these convexity effects, you're going to have that collateral gets eaten very fast, and then the price of the stable coin increases even faster under the circumstances, because as I said, when you have additional liquidations, the effects add up in a non-linear way, so you, so you have the, a large uh, effect on the price, and then and so on and so forth. This could continue for several rounds. So um, now this brings me to the other set of results that we have. Um, assuming that the stablecoin demand uh, and expected ether return are constant, uh, if you have that the leverage constraint, if you don't enter this kind of spirals and the leverage constraint remains inactive, well, the system is going to behave very nicely. And the stablecoin is essentially going to behave like a risk-free bond. Um, and it's gonna, the, the, the system converges exponentially to a steady state in which the price is stable and the volatility of that stable coin is close to zero. Now, it could be, however, that the steady state may have prices smaller than one. And that is because in the stable regime, uh, the speculator's expectation of ETH could be high. So, um, and, and now what we also conjecture, we haven't proven that yet, but that we also conjecture is that Outside of the stable regime, you have uh, um, that the volatility 
of the the stable coin is bounded away from zero, um, and that hap with, with high probability. So once you are outside of the stable regime, you are very likely to stay outside due to these feedback effects. And uh, mathematically, this is because you have a kink in the probability distribution of remaining outside uh, the, the stable domain when you hit this boundary. Now, the nice thing is that this, this, this effect, um, so first of all, we can quantify this effect. So we can say when is the, when is the, the, the instrument in a stable or an unstable regime. Um, but they also explain data from, the, from, from, from existing uh, stablecoin markets. So what you see there is that exactly this kind of story, um, uh, well, on, on the graph, you have this leverage reduction uh, feedback. Where, so here you are reducing the volume in the market, and then you see this spike in, 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 the, in the price um, of, the, of the stable coin. And you also see what we believe now happening in a steady state. We also see that you have that um, the, um, the uh, price... Um, is below target. So now um, this this whole risk management um, and the, the the existence of this potential uh, deleveraging spirals. Well, this translates into risk, and we can compute the probability of these risks. So if I am to give some insights from this work, um, well, the first thing is would be to find ways by which we could widen the stable region. So you want to widen the stable region and you want to limit the severity of the unstable re region. And you want, basically what I've presented here, is a setup with one type of collateral, ether. But you could have a dynamic selection of collateral to be liquidated on the market and that could be based on updated belief on the volatility of each individual constituent of this collateral pool. Um, another important thing is that you do not want to have fees that are affecting the equity of the of the of the speculators on top of uh, on top of their uh, deleveraging, um, consuming their 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 equity. So what one, another important point is that one can think about counter cyclic fees to keep speculator in the market. And indeed, this could be very interesting to relate to the way we maintain liquidity in other types of market by doing doing bonus and rebates for them to remain when, when to, and to mitigate these uh, deleveraging spirals. And uh, the other uh, important idea would be to introduce a form of convertible debt, and which means a convertible layer between the equity and the senior debt. So some intermediary structure between the stablecoin holders and the um, and the um, and the speculators. So here's my key takeaway, and I, I know that I'm always. Uh, you know, out of time. Um, so the leveraging sp uh, spirals are key in understanding the risk and prices of the various tranches in the structure of a stable coin. And mitigated, these spirals can lead to attack incentives. So I haven't spoken about this, but you can think about what happens. Well, if you know you're going to have um, a liquidation spiral, and if you know that, um, as I said, having a certain order of transactions gives different effects on the price as those transactions reordered slightly different. And that's something that we never saw in the traditional market, because in the traditional market, everything goes to the same computer. But here you can extract, you can extract value by reordering transactions, so this could lead to different, uh, different attack incentives. Um, so this underlies also the high level um, of liquidity risk management needed to make these assets stay stable as long as possible. Okay, thank you so much.